name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, where we die, and die. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, we have come almost to the end of this blessed pilgrimage. For me personally, it was quite a blessed pilgrimage. For all, it is always a great grace to come to this holy land and to be in these holy places. This year particularly, I saw several signs which are very comforting especially this uh, friendship, which is quite, not unusual, but quite striking, friendship with the Orthodox monks, some two Orthodox monks, one on the Mount of Temptation, who gave me a beautiful card of our Blessed Mother Mary, and she said, you Catholics and we Orthodox love Our Lady very much, but the Protestants... <laughs> and, so, and, uh, and also this morning, at the church of the tomb of Mary, there was a nun, an Orthodox nun, and I asked her, do you love Our Lady? And she said, oh, I do. And she said, I give my life to her. That's beautiful. Another, so this is the way to, uh, to have a very good ecumenism with these uh, Orthodox brethren. And also another Orthodox monk from Greece was uh, two, three uh, days ago. I met him while coming back from the sepulchre. He was sitting just beside the Casanova. And uh, he asked me, what's your name? And I said, Father Serafino. Oh, all right. The next day I met him again and he remembered my name and called me by name. And he, and he hugged me. And he invited me to go to Greece, to their monastery. In, and <laughs> he, gave, <laughs> he gave me his telephone number. I don't know how we could manage to, to, to understand each other, because I was speaking English. He was speaking maybe Greek or something. <laughs> and uh, yes, he said, come to, Gre to Athens. He's in. <laughs> so it's quite a beautiful sign to see this. Uh, ah, another sign, very beautiful, which is quite striking, is this. I went to the veiling, uh, veiling, veiling wall, but just to observe, just to see from uh, a distance. While coming out, almost by the end of the gate, there were some uh, Jews. I think Orthodox as well. For the first time, one of them greeted me, just bowing like this. And I did the same to him. Fra fraternally, I said, I said within myself, fraternally, I want to greet you. He was smiling. Normally, they spit on us. But uh, I don't know what's the reason. There was another guy beside him asking for money for the Jewish Passover. But he wasn't asking for any money. I just passed by. I said, I have nothing to give. But uh, he, he fraternally, if we can say this, uh, smiled and uh, made a sign with his head. It's beautiful. And uh, anyway, uh, this could be seen as a sign of, uh, sign of friendship, which is the very first step to be acceptance. Mm, acceptance. You never know. Hopefully, one day we will be all reconciled in the one true church, the only true church of Christ.
this is our hope and our prayer. And I think the very important point, the key point to have a true reconciliation with, especially with the Orthodox Church, is Our Lady. She's the bond of unity. Because we love Our Lady very much. They love Our Lady very much. And uh, she can be the mother of unity. Because as you might already know, the Orthodox Church, uh, differently uh, from all other Christian denominations, has kept all sacraments the real priesthood, the true Holy Eucharist, because they have kept the true apostolic succession with the bishops validly ordained. So they have all sacraments. We have the same faith, the same apostolic creed, although they do not accept some the dogmas proclaimed by the Church after the schism, the, the schism of uh, 1054, when the Orthodox Church was, was split from the communion with the Latin Church. But the, anyway, the only communion, the hierarchical communion is lacking so far. But uh, Our Lady is the one who has to make this union with them in the one true Catholic Apostolic Church. And the one shepherd, one, one, one pastor, the Pope, who is the representative of Christ. Good. So, this said, let's come to the point now of this last talk, last supper. The point is, uh, first of all, I said that there is some, uh, something special to be tackled during this talk. But before addressing this key point of the talk, first a question. What is the most important place in the Holy Land? That's a very difficult question. Actually, this was raised by Saint Jerome himself. As you know, Saint Jerome uh, came to Holy Land and he lived for 30 years where? in Bethlehem. He wanted to live near Bethlehem, the place of Jesus' birth, in order to have a hermit life and to be very uh, dealing every day with the study of this culture, the language, the Hebrew, and, uh, and also the, his main work was the translation of the Bible from Hebrew into, into Latin, especially the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, Saint Jerome raised this question, what is the most important place in this holy land? You want, do you want to know his answer? Yes. Be careful. He says all places are very important. But wait, wait, the place where Jesus was born, the place where Jesus began his public life, the place where Jesus was crucified, the place we just saw this morning where Jesus, was, uh, Jesus ascended into heaven, yes, but there is one place which in his own words is fittingly more, more, uh, the word he uses is fittingly more, uh, Im not important, but uh, with a more uh, devotion, so to say, to be paid to this place. No. 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 <laughs> no. Wrong. No. His words are 
it is, there is a place which is fittingly more, more, I missed the word again. <laughs> <laughs> more, re, uh, uh, anyway, anyway, it will come to me later. More, more Yeah, where there is more devotion more to be to be paid devotion. to this. No. The place more important in terms of devotion is where Jesus was born. I did not hear better. You said yes. According to him, the most important place where in the Holy Land, that's why he chose among all places in this Holy Land, Bethlehem to live in. And it is because of his permanence in that place that such a wisdom came to Saint Jerome. He wanted to, to live there and also to meet several people, local people, uh, as well as uh, rabbis, in order to, to understand deeply this culture and in order to translate the Bible with this biblical background, very, very strong biblical background. So according to him, uh, Bethlehem is the place which, which has to be held in great esteem because of the beginning, because of the birth of Jesus. And he says that that place is important because of the poverty Jesus is teaching us. And of course it is the beginning of his, of his life. And the beginning normally is, uh, already holds most of the journey Jesus is going through. In the beginning, we can already see something of the public life, even the pain of the death of our Lord on the cross. And this, this link between the birth and the cross is very much highlighted by one particular thing, which also our guide explained when we were at the place of the shepherds. When Jesus was born, he was wrapped up in swaddling clothes. And of course, Saint Jerome, in commenting on the Gospel of Saint Matthew, says that these swaddling clothes are prefiguring the shroud in which Jesus was wrapped up after being taken down from the cross. So you see this interior bond between the beginning and the completion of his, uh, his earthly life. So that's why I think, this is my own interpretation, Saint Jerome is uh, saying, favoring Bethlehem, because in that poverty, in that great uh, anguish, and uh, the way Jesus was laid in a manger, is already also prefiguring the death of Jesus on the cross, the way Jesus was laid on this, this very, very hard and painful uh, bed he had at, at the very moment of his, uh, at his final moment, when he died for us. So, Bethlehem is very important. From this, we can now try to understand more a beautiful figure which is very discreet but very powerful in all mysteries of Christ. At least we have to say in most of the mysteries of Christ. There is a particular figure very important but at the same time, very discreet and hidden. This is a person, a very important man. Saint Joseph, 
I want to say something about this great figure, Saint Joseph, who can be chosen by us as a tour guide, <laughs> so to speak, to, to be in this holy land. Who better than Saint Joseph can teach us how to spiritually journey in this holy land, from a place to another one. So I think we have to, especially today, this is his feast day, we have to choose Saint Joseph as a spiritual father, spiritual guide, <clears throat> to teach us how to enter properly with our mind, as Saint Jerome did actually, our mind, our heart, our thoughts, our culture, uh, everything we own, enter this, this mystery, the mystery which is held in this blessed land, this holy land of God. Have you ever tried to know more about Saint Joseph? No. Saint Joseph unfortunately remains a hidden figure, but we have to bring Saint Joseph to light because he's very important. And I would like to uh, emphasize more the fact that Saint Joseph is a model for us, a model to be pilgrims in this holy land and a model to take our lady as he did, as our own mother, spouse, and to be consecrated to Our Lady, to be closer and closer to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Saint Joseph is the, the pattern of this acceptance of Our Lady, the Blessed Mother Mary, and through her, the pattern of this embracing of the mystery of God. Saint Joseph literally embraced with his arms the mystery. But how was this possible? Because of his relationship with Our Lady. Everything in Saint Joseph's life comes through Mary, our mother. Pay attention to this. We now see some of the biblical texts to make sure that Saint Joseph is, uh, to make sure how Saint Joseph is in relationship to Jesus. He's, he's never directly linked with our Lord. Pay attention to this when you read the Gospels. Everything in Saint Joseph's life comes through Mary, through this mediation of our Blessed Mother Mary. Let's see why. First, the very first mention of Saint Joseph, uh, first of all, do you know any word of Saint Joseph spoken? Is there any word accounted by the Gospels said by Saint Joseph? No. Why not? This is another important thing to consider. When there is the necessity to say something, it is not Saint Joseph speaking, but Mary. But when there is something to do in a very uh, important way, in a very uh, male attitude, it is Saint Joseph who is in charge. For example, when they have to flee into Egypt, it is Saint Joseph, advised by the angel to flee, who takes his wife and the baby and go. This is very important. Why Saint Joseph, Saint Joseph is not talking, but doing? This is one of the greatest characteristics. One of the greatest characteristics <coughs> of Saint Joseph. That's an example that we should be following. We talk too much and do nothing because we're not listening to yes. God speaking to us. 
Yes. For example, pray silence and prayer. We learn, we learn to know God's will and then the interaction. Yes. He's a man of very few words. When it is the time to, to speak, his, his uh, person comes into play, his role of a father comes into play always through Our Lady. Because Our Lady is the one who is the, the Ark of the Covenant. He has been called to preserve this Ark of the Covenant, to be the keeper of the Ark of the Covenant, which means to keep Our Lady and within her there is Jesus, to keep the treasure hidden within Our Lady, the Ark of the Covenant. So everything is always uh, passing from St. Joseph through Mary to Jesus, from Jesus through Mary to St. Joseph, from God through Mary to St. Joseph. This is one of the greatest uh, sign of this, this uh, grandeur of Saint Joseph. First of all, you see what happens in the genealogy according to Saint Matthew. Saint Matthew, look at this chapter, when the, cha the first chapter, when there is this uh, genealogy divided in three groups, each one containing 14 generations. We come to the last generation and we read something very surprising. First of all, keep in mind that for the Jewish culture, the mother is not generating. It is the father generating. That's why the wife, the mother, is never mentioned when there is the genealogy, because it is the father generating. The mother gives birth to the son, right? But it is the father generating. But when we come to St. Joseph, there is something very surprising. Why? Let's see. We come almost by the end. Jacob begot Joseph. Jacob, the father of St. Joseph. Yes? Joseph is the husband of Mary, and then stop. Now, what would have been the consequence? Joseph begot Jesus. Is this the case? No. Because Jesus did, uh, Joseph did not beget Jesus, but Jesus is the fruit of Our Lady's virginal conception and birth. So, with Our Lady there is a jump, there is an interruption in this genealogy to highlight the mystery. Joseph did not generate Jesus, but he is the foster father of Jesus. Only Mary has generated our Lord. And in fact, we read in the Gospel, Joseph is the husband of Mary. This is also something very strange to mention in a genealogy that his role to be there is because of Mary. This is strange, but this is the mystery. Joseph is called to be the husband of Mary, to be in relationship with Jesus. He has no direct relationship with our Lord. But through Mary, because he is the husband of Mary, the husband of Mary, and of her, Jesus, who is called Christ, was born. Out and of her, Jesus was born. For the culture of, for this culture, Still now, it is the same. For this uh, Jewish background, to say that Jesus uh, uh, comes directly from Mary is something astonishing. You can say this only if there is a mystery coming into play. The mystery of Jesus' virginal conception. 
Who is the Father of Christ? The Father in heaven who has generated the Son since eternity. This generation in time is just an extension, so to speak, of that eternal generation. So the human generation of the Son has to resemble the eternal generation of the world. This is why Our Lady's Virgin and Our Lady's virginity is the manifestation in time of God's eternal generation in eternity. This is also why Jesus is celibate in his life. We have to stress this once again because the celibacy of Jesus in not taking any wife in not being married is not something very managerial, so to speak, in order to be facilitated in doing his ministry. And they say the same for priests. They do not get married to be more available for parishioners. Is this the case? I did not get married. No. It is not about a practical uh, facility to be more available for the people. No. The reason Jesus is celibate is because is this, because he is completely consecrated to God, the Father. He is virginally con generated by the Father in heaven. He is virginally generated by the Mother on earth. One generation in heaven, one generation on earth. In heaven, from the Father only, on earth from the Mother only. You see the mystery. One Father, our Father, who art in heaven. One Mother, who is on earth. The Virgin Mary. Yes? Does it make sense? Yes. This is the reason the Church has always held in great esteem celibacy for priests. Since the beginning, since the life of Christ and his apostles, the apostles were married, but they had to renounce to be, to still live as married people. They still kept their wives, but not, not living anymore in a mar marital uh, relationship, but following Christ. In order to be like him. All right? Let's come back to Joseph. Joseph now is the husband of Mary. And this marriage with Mary is the, the moment when St. Joseph comes into the mystery. He now enters properly, officially, into the mystery of God, to be chosen as the Father of Christ. Keep this in mind, St. Joseph, because of his relationship, marital relationship, virginal, with Mary, now is united with our Lord Jesus Christ. And now let's come to the point when uh, Mary is pregnant. Mary, our lady, is found pregnant by Joseph. This is a beautiful page, but we have to interpret it carefully. Yes? Because we might easily say St. Joseph was very upset with his wife. Is this the case? No. On the one hand, we have the justice of Joseph. Joseph is the just man, which means the holy man. He could not even doubt of his wife. He knew that his wife was a holy wife. Yes, he knew Our Lady. And of course, he accepted to be married with her, accepting to have a virginal marriage. This is an important point, stressed very much by Saint Jerome again, you know, we now normally see uh, paintings of St. Joseph as an old man. 
octogenarian man and sometimes depicted as a widower with other, other children from another marriage. And you see St. Joseph old with a, a white beard, with his walking stick. <coughs> no. You know where this, this kind of idea comes from? St. Jerome is uh, hitting this kind of a very funny idea, an image of St. Joseph. This idea comes from the apocryphal writings. Writings do not accept it by the Church as inspired by God. They were emphasizing the old age of St. Joseph in order to keep Our Lady's virginity safe to say that he was married with her, but since he was an old man, he had to respect the virginity of Mary. No, St. Jerome is saying this is completely wrong. This is a creation, fantasy, of these apocryphal writings, but this is not the case. St. Joseph was a young man, a beautiful man, but who chose to be completely dedicated to God himself. And he accepted, since he took a lady as his wife, at this moment, the moment of the, the, when he found out that a lady was pregnant, they were already married, but the marriage was at his first stage, which was the official <coughs> engagement, right? The engagement was already a proper marriage, although they do not, did not live together yet, right? But if something happened during the first uh, moment of engagement, for example, the adultery, the, 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 the wife had to be put to stone. Because this was already an official marriage. So, St. Joseph is a young man who accepted to be completely consecrated to God by living virginally with Mary. In a very spiritual way, we can say that the celibacy of priests begins with Jesus, with Mary, with St. Joseph. These big moments of Christian life. Yes? So let's come to St. Joseph now. He discovers that his wife is pregnant, but he knows that the son is not his. What to do? On the one hand, he is a just man. St. Jerome says, if he is a just man, he cannot accept something which is not true. And he knows that he is not the father, so he cannot cover up that, that uh, situation. He has to take an action, what to do. But on the other hand, he cannot expose his wife because he knows that his wife is innocent. But he does not understand. He is not able to understand yet what is happening. And you see the greatness of St. Joseph at this beautiful moment, what he does. He we rose in silence. The Gospel says he decided to divorce privately. So not to say anything publicly, otherwise his wife would have been put to stone according to the law of Moses. What he does, this is the best choice to do. He does not know what to do because the evidence is that our lady is pregnant, but what to do? He cannot accept that baby. He's not the father. He's a just man. Cannot accept something which is not true. So in his wisdom, St. Joseph decides just to disappear. Yes? And to perhaps wait for God to say something. And the Gospel says,
But while he thought on these things, while he thought in this moment, he's thinking what to do, so the best way out is to disappear. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Do not be afraid, Joseph, son of David, to take to thee Mary thy wife, for that which is begotten in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Of course, St. Joseph now remembers clearly the prophecy of Isaiah in the Old Testament, quoted by Matthew in this chapter. Isaiah chapter 7. And this all came to pass, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets might be fulfilled. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Did St. Joseph know this prophecy of Isaiah? No? Was he reading the Bible at all? Of course he was. He was a great Jew a very pious Jew, praying day and night with Psalms, with the Bible. He knew, even by heart, some passages of the Bible. He knew the prophecies about the Messiah. He was a pious Jew waiting for the Messiah. When he heard these words from the angel, immediately he remembered the prophecy of Isaiah, and this is the reason he has no question. He's not objecting anything. In a dream, saying, but who are you? The Holy Spirit will come upon her. What is conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? A virgin and so on. No. St. Joseph is not questioning anything. Why? Because he's a man of God. He's a just man. This shows us once again that he was not doubting beforehand on Our Lady's fidelity to him. No. He was not able to understand the mystery because there was a mystery at, uh, at work in Our Lady's womb. Now that he has understood what happened, so he is completely aware no objection. What he says? Nothing. He does what the angel said. He just does what the angel said. A man of few words. We have to say man of no word. <laughs> yes? No word. Only actions. And this is the holiness of St. Joseph. Holiness in the Bible is this kind, this uh, uh, unity between deeds and <coughs> thoughts, thoughts and deeds. Saint Joseph has, is a just man because of this great, great uh, obedience to God. In his silence, in his prayer, he is enlightened by God. And then he uh, makes up his mind now and does God's will. He is obeying. He understands what is happening in Our Lady's womb. And then he is ready to obey and to be the Father of Christ. To give to him the name of Jesus. This is important to understand that Joseph now, through Mary, who is generating Christ, not Joseph, Mary, he's generating and giving birth to Christ, has the role to give him a name. That is, to be a father to that child. 
from now onward, Saint Joseph, and since the moment of the birth, Saint Joseph officially is the father of this baby, the father of Christ, the keeper of the mystery. And then there is another particular in the Gospel, which is very important. Now, the Gospel describes uh, what Saint Joseph did. Saint Joseph, Joseph, arising from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took unto him his wife. Look at these words carefully. Saint Joseph arose, obeyed, and took his wife unto him. No word, only actions, again. Right? But I think, this is my own interpretation. If I'm wrong, you can object something. My interpretation is this, that in these words we have the very first Marian consecration. Is this true? Can I say that? Joseph takes Mary unto him as his wife. Joseph had taken Mary already unto him. He was already keen on the fact of being a husband to Mary. But now he is accepting Mary in a new fashion, a very complete new way. The way to take his wife in a mystical way, because he knows the mystery acting in Mary, and what he has to do to take his wife in order to take the baby, to keep the baby, to be the, ma to be the father of that baby. There is another word which is very close to this. The word expressing clearly the meaning of Marian consecration. What is this word? The other word in the Gospel. Saint... The Gospel. No, I mean a reference describing Marian consecration in the Gospel. What is the best, the best verse, the best Gospel for this job? No, come on, no. Another Gospel. The Gospel of? St. John, chapter 19, 19. When? Jesus is dying on the cross. Yes, before dying on the cross, looking at his uh, mother, says, Woman, behold your son. And to the son, to, to John, behold your mother. And then, what happens? Precisely, John took Mary unto him as his mother. Right? Did our lady uh, only need a shelter? Does this mean that John was sheltering Mary? In a sense, yes, because Mary had no other son. She had a need to be looked after. But this is not the only meaning of this text. The true meaning is deeper. John takes Mary unto him, in sua accepit, the Latin. In sua is very much expressive of this action, not just to bring Our Lady into his house to shelter Mary, but to take Our Lady into his life, into him, as his mother. Yes? Not only being an adoptive mother, to look after her, but to bring Our Lady into his life, unto him. This is the formula of Marian consecration. John takes Mary unto him. In a mystical way, we can say John was married mystically to Mary, because Marian consecration is always a mystical marriage, is a consecration a way to be one with Mary, to love Mary,
to take her as a mother. Yes? So, consecration, in a sense, is a mystical marriage with Mary. But the very first who does it is who? John? Saint Joseph is the first who takes Mary unto him. So dear ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, we have to write a beautiful book. <laughs> Starting with Saint Joseph consecrated to Our Lady. And then we come to, to understand John, and with John, all other people who are consecrated to Mary since that moment. Yes? Of course, John, keep this in mind, John is a priest. He is taken by Mary as a priest. And this is expressing also this way to be united with Mary. Of every priest, any priest has to take Mary as his mother. Because you see, it is not about sheltering Mary, because if John is on Calvary, it is because of Mary, not because of John. John is there. He's, what is happening now? He was frightened. He would have escaped, as all others did, because it was a moment of torture. He feared to be put to death himself. So as, uh, John, so as Peter did. Yes, Peter and all other apostles escaped out of fear. Only John is on Calvary. Why? Because he is drunk by Our Lady. Come with me, my son. So John is there because of Mary. And Our Lady is taking John in order to make that revelation possible. The revelation of the motherhood of Mary towards everyone. But that motherhood, as its first beginning, as Marian consecration at the moment of the marriage with Saint Joseph. All right? Let's come to the final point. The very final point. Don't worry. <laughs> to be continued on the, on the plane. I take the microphone. <laughs> Anyway, just a promotional message, a commercial. If you come to the day with Mary, <laughs> you will have a lot of inputs of Mary, and you will discover more, much more, about Our Lady. But you have to come to the day with Mary. Final, the final point. Uh, another place where St. Joseph is present, but always in a hidden manner. This is the moment when Jesus was found in the temple, among the doctors. Joseph is there. He's, in, he's uh, looking, at, looking for Jesus with Mary. They are desperate, because where is this little boy? He disappears. Then, they finally come to the temple, yes? yes? And they find Jesus talking, teaching to the doctors. Who is taking, who is speaking now? Mary. Yes. And his mother said to him, it is not the father. This is also some, something surprising. When the father is present, it is the father correcting the boy. But uh, Joseph, this is not a manifesto of feminism, <laughs> no, where the woman is in charge, I'm in charge, <coughs> no, <coughs> it is not about, femi the Bible is not feminist, as well as the Bible is not masculist, no, it does not mean anything for the Bible, mm -hmm. the Bible reveals the truth. And there is a beautiful meaning in these words. His mother said to him, Son, why hast thou done so to us? This is a, a question which is not only something uh, revealing the anguish of their hearts, but it is a question revealing 
something deeper. And from the answer of Jesus, we understand that there is something deeper. Behold, in sorrow, thy father and I, I have been seeking thee, thy father and I. And I. This is only for the English language, because the English language puts always thy father and I. The person acting is the second subject. But this is only for the English language. In other languages, the person acting is the first, and the other person is the second. But anyway, thy father and I were looking for you in sorrow. Why has to done this to us? So Joseph is not speaking, silent. It is Mary speaking, thy father and I. She is presenting again Joseph to Jesus. Of course Jesus knows that Joseph is his father. But it is always Mary bringing, Jesus, bringing Joseph to Jesus. Right? There is always this connection. When Our Lady is the mediatrix of union of a soul with Jesus. So do not dare to live a Christian life putting Our Lady aside. You have no Christian life without Mary. No way to go to Jesus without Mary. And this is very clear with St. Joseph. Without Mary there is no possibility for St. Joseph to be with Christ to be the father of Christ, to be the one, uh, the husband of Mary. He's the husband of Mary, and then he's the father of Christ. So, you've, thy father and I, but Jesus said, how is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Look at this. Thy father and I were looking for you, and Jesus answers, I must be about my father business. That's beautiful. St. Joseph is not speaking, but Our Lady is, in a, in a way, connecting now. St. Joseph, the earthly father, through Jesus, with the heavenly father. We have one father on earth, one Father in heaven. Of course, Jesus is not a, a naughty boy saying, but why were you looking for me? I have something else to do. No. Jesus is revealing that his first duty is to be in relationship with God the Father. And only in this business with God the Father, also St. Joseph's place takes significance. Otherwise, no point for St. Joseph to be the father of Christ. That's why, according to several authors, St. Joseph is the manifestation on earth, the shadow on earth, of God the Father in heaven. That's great. Thy father and I, I must be about my my father's business. You see the greatness of Saint Joseph. He is there, he is suffering, and he is now revealed, we can say, as the shadow of God the Father <coughs> in heaven. In order, not, in order not to make us, in order not to make us think that Jesus is a naughty boy, and he's answering something back to his parents. The Gospel says, He went down with them, came to Nazareth, and was subject to them. Subject to them. To whom? To, Jesus, to Joseph and Mary, obedient to his Father on earth. So the mystery of the, of the uh, finding of Jesus in the temple is the mystery of the revelation, in a sense, of St. Joseph's great paternal ministry, but a silent ministry. So, dear brethren, what we learn from this? 
that Saint Joseph is truly great. And we learn also that Mary <coughs> is important to be in relationship with Jesus. Saint Joseph is the pattern of Marian consecration. Next time you come to Holy Land, since you leave your house, take Saint Joseph with you. Yes? And uh, consecrate yourself to Saint Joseph to ask him to guide you through these holy places, to understand properly the blessing which is present in this holy land. Okay? So we have to thank to Saint Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father.